ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello and welcome to Science Faction 42, the answer to the universe. I am your host, comedian and scientist, Robert Timothy, and with me as always is our lovely and talented research scientist, Jackie. Jackie, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm ready to stretch my my mind and and learn from the master of the universe. Good. You know, about comedy and science. Not from Damien. He doesn't know much about those, but definitely from All I can tell show. you, the answer to all your questions is 42. And that other person you heard about is our comedian and co-host, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing? Wasn't like Hank Aaron 42, so Hank Aaron's the answer? I'm going to take it you never read uh, no. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. No, but I did see the movie, so I did get the reference. Oh, okay. Fair enough. I thought, you know, why not give a shout out to Hank Aaron, who this podcast is loosely dedicated to. Yeah, hmm. and who was our original host. And if you want to see Hank Aaron do his one-man stand-up set, Delirious, come on out to the Madhouse <laughs> Comedy Club in downtown San Diego, where we're currently broadcasting this podcast out of. That's racist. Right after you check out Science Articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, guys, some very interesting articles coming out. We're changing the history of humankind in a few different ways. Uh, let's dive time right machines? in. Time machines? This, this clearly involves time We machines. do have a Marty yeah. McFly reference later, so hold on to that thought. Gotcha. Uh, first article, ancient human boning. Yes! This story is really interesting. This is all centers around a human thigh bone that was found in Siberia recently. It turned out to be 45,000 years old. Wait a minute, a 45,000-year-old bone? Mm -hmm. I thought you were supposed to call a company. I didn't go down after four hours. Yeah, that's right. He had a massive erection that was preserved in the fossil record permanently. That's incredible. Damien said it couldn't be done. Who's laughing now? In Russia, it's bones me. find you. <laughs> so this is the oldest directly radiocarbon dated modern human outside of Africa and the Middle East. His diet consisted mainly of plants and plant-eating fish. And his genetic code suggests that he has no living descendants today. So even though he was part of a larger group that has living descendants, he personally, like most of the things that have lived on the face of the earth, no longer have living descendants around. Most of the things that can't get laid. Whoa. That's right. Burn, laid, burn, bone. This is an ancient Siberian nerd, if you ask me. <laughs> Just couldn't, couldn't pull the trigger, huh? Yeah. His mom coddled him way too much. He was doomed from the start. His teenage years were so awkward. So here's how it gets interesting. This guy, who's 45,000 years ago in Siberia, is more related to people living outside of Africa today than to Africans, making him a member of one of the most ancient non-African populations. This is one of the first groups to kind of leave Africa and the Near East mm -hmm. and go explore the rest of the world, and he was part of that. In fact, he goes back so far that thanks to comparisons between a 24,000-year-old boy from Siberia and an 8,000-year-old man from Spain, they found that because of his relation to those, they can prove that he was part of that population that later split and became Asians on one side and Europeans on the other. He's part of the population that's a grandfather to both of those groups. 24,000-year-old boy. How does an African have to be before you will stop calling him boy? He's from Siberia, dude. <laughs> He was that first group out, you know, like that's <laughs> from Africa. We're Siberians now. Stop calling us boy. We've been here for <laughs> generations. <laughs> so he lived just before or right around the time uh, of the split of human populations in Western and Eastern Eurasia. So that's really impressive. This guy is part of the ancestral population to a large group of what we consider very different and diverse human beings. Well, being that he couldn't get laid, he's not an ancestor to many people. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he's part of a group that was. <laughs> he's the uh, creepy uncle who yeah. never... But it keeps getting more interesting because even though they know he was around that time, he should be exactly equally related to Western Europeans and to East Asians. When they look, he's not. Among present-day populations, he's more closely related to East Asians than Europeans, which suggests that while he had ancestors that split off, half of which went over to Asia, half of which went to Europe and became the Europeans, the ones that became the Europeans then had some other breeding going on probably with another group that came out of Africa. Another really interesting thing that came out of the in analyzation of this guy's genetics the is... The analyzation? Yes, we <laughs> performed we some Sorry. very uh, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, tests wanna, on the wanna, bone. Is that what you said? A yeah. Analyzation? Okay. Nothing like bone marrow down there. Scientists know that Neanderthals were actually still present in Eurasia while this guy was alive. And sure enough, when we looked at his genetics, we all know that we have Neanderthal DNA. We looked at him. 
he did too. And based on the link... We're all the same on the inside. I'm picking up what you're putting down. That's right. We're all people. Stop hitting on me. (laughs) More than that, even, it tells us an amazing thing about when this happened. Because we can look back and say he has about the same percentage, about 2.3 to 2.5% Neanderthal DNA in there. Based on the length of the snippets of that Neanderthal genome code, they're not all cut up like they are in us, we can tell around when that got introduced to the Homo sapien population, which is about 10,000 years before this guy lived. And we can't seem to see any indication of further interbreeding with Neanderthals. In fact, some scientists think it might have only happened once in all of human history. Now we know kind of like when it happened. one super epic bone. Yeah, just like one. Just... <laughs> maybe it was a gangbang. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's that the two species were so incompatible that they fucked a lot and they only had one successful offspring. Maybe, maybe that, they oh, didn't man. Maybe they didn't get together a lot. Maybe they got scared of us. I, who, who knows? But the, the fact is we know it happened maybe at least Dr. once. Maybe Dr. Drew kept them from having sex at a young age. <laughs> maybe this was humanity's early form, – like its early 20s. It was out having a good time. Yeah, it didn't want to commit – from a very conservative Siberian community, mm-hmm. you know, had sex with, a, with the equivalent of a black chick in that area, you yeah. know, like really pissed people off. You this, know? They, we actually think the interbreeding probably happened in the Middle East, like we said, about 10,000 years before this dude died in Siberia. Super interesting news. Very interesting to peg down when this happened in human history, kind of where it happened and some very ancient evidence of it. Very, very cool genetic stuff. couple of questions for my panel. Question number one. We now know that interbreeding with Neanderthals might have only happened once or a select few times, and it dated to 10,000 years before this guy died. Why did we choose to nail them once 60,000 years ago and then not at all for the next 30,000 years of their existence? I think they were a needy population. You yeah. know, there was like too many calls, too many texts the next day. You know, I just sort of, I want this to keep casual you know it's like Damien said I'm young I'm virile yeah I kind of want to spread it around and you're just really clingy stage five clinger Neanderthals you'd also need to have the right type because Neanderthals in general were shorter squatter than us bigger rib ca- you'd like a you'd, li- you'd have to like a thick woman you know yeah. but the good news is unlike Homo sapien Neanderthals did not have good long distance running Homo sapiens one of the best long distance runners on earth it's how we used to track down our prey we'd chase them down until they collapse and we'd kill them we could get away from <laughs> Man, these that is badass yeah <laughs> We could get away from these Neanderthals pretty damn easy. I doubt any of them had like a sub seven mile. You know, it'd be real easy to get away. Oh, okay. And by the way, I don't want to hear any personal anecdotes from any of the fans at home saying, you know, a Neanderthal who can clear six minutes. Yes, yeah. I get it. They exist. We yeah, know right. that. Yeah. Damien, why do you think we boned them that one time and then took them out of our little black book? Well, just like there was a time when nobody knew that you could go on a date with a woman and then it turns out it's a dude. And then Maury Povich fixed that. Well, I think 65,000 years ago, there were a lot of humans who were like, hell yeah, these hairy, you know, slow chicks who can't mm-hmm. run. Yeah. Who are super buff. Yeah. Like, like hell yeah. Like pre-Italians. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then one day, you know, she comes out on the early human equivalent to Maury and comes out that she's a Neanderthal. And yeah. then, by the way, once the word's out there, now yeah. everybody's on the lookout. And by the way, it's a really easy test to, to do. Yeah. Yeah. Turns out you are not the father of this offspring. <laughs> Yeah, it's really confusing that, you know, we know human beings interbred a whole bunch when they met each other. It is weird that we only had one Like right when they met? Yeah, pretty much. Like shake hands straight to it? It's pretty weird that we were around this entire other species for upwards of thirty to 40,000 years in close proximity, you know, making similar tools, all this kind of stuff, and yet we only have what looks to be one instance of successful interbreeding. Yeah, but we're all the same species, and look how long it was before interracial dating was okay. Oh, that shit happened all the time. Yeah, but you know what I mean, like socially accepted. (laughs) Okay, Thomas Jefferson. What if it's more like Footloose, but like the preacher won. Like yeah. no breeding oh, with Neanderthal. Okay. And there's like a wins. hot there's a hot Neanderthal just trying to breed with human women who's going and he's like flash dancing all over the place. And, it looks like Kevin Bacon, right? Yeah. It looks like Kevin Bacon if you were yeah. Neanderthal. Right. So looks like Kevin Bacon. Right. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, the preacher's force just come in and kill him while he's dancing. I hate to throw in baby the in the corner, but let's move on to question number two. This guy was part That's of the, the wrong movie. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Finally, movies I get the references to. Question number two. This guy was part of the founding population of Asians and Europeans. What mixture of stereotypical racial traits must he have had? <laughs> he stinks, but it's the combination of bo and fish oil. Okay. Which is a real thing at my work, I'll let you know right now. (laughs) 
I work in a corridor with Europeans and Asians. I mean, well, they were practically the same people up until the Great Rice Schism of 45,000 years ago. No, oh, really? I mean, is that when was... it, that's when it split? Is yeah, that the split you're talking about? Long before rice was agriculturally produced. Yeah. <laughs> Damien, I'm, I'm really they looking pull... for you to pull through on this. This is your bread and butter here. A man who is equal part short and rude. Yeah. Tiny okay. dicks. Just all around. That's the way it works. Tiny dicks. We were looking for, he can crash into a lot of cars on his way to work, and he still won't get pulled over. All right, on to question <laughs> number three. The study hints at an additional genetic contribution to European ancestry, likely from additional migrants from Africa. That would mean that white people are blacker than both Asians and their descendants, New World Native Americans. White people are blacker than Mexicans, guys. Insert racist joke here. Damien, again, I'm really expecting some big things from you. I just turned my head and looked at you. First off, anything I say is going to be a hate so. crime against you because you're the whitest person in this <laughs> That's room. That's right. Or the blackest by that <laughs> definition. <laughs> uh, you're right. You guys both have mestizo yeah. ancestry. I'm clearly so the blackest guy here. you are the homie of all of us? I'm all so I'm sorry to have offended you. I mean, I've, I've clearly you have offended your proud me. African heritage by calling you white. <laughs> No, that's part of my proud black heritage, clearly, as this you can see here. This explains so much about you, like that weird thing where you're always stealing cars. Yeah, and my love for heavy women. Also, I would like to have a talk with you guys later about reparations. Yeah, we're Mexican. We don't have any fucking money. Yeah. <laughs> you always have cocoa butter on you. <laughs> and I don't crack. On to article number two, vegetable mixer. New research suggests the easy way to detect brain activity in those previously thought to be brain dead. This is a really interesting follow-up to another interesting story that we did a little while ago. Something that's been really rocking the neuroscience community in the last year, year and a half, is the discovery that people we previously thought were in comas, completely brain dead, actually have some kind of cognition going on and are, in some sense of the word, interacting with the outside world. These are people who have been in severe comas that don't seem to show any indication whatsoever that they're awake, that they're alive, anything. But, I know. So, like, I mean, but now all of a sudden they can theoretically finger you in court? Like, it just to pay you back for the finger you gave them? Like, this is bullshit. I don't know. You're not allowed to finger people in court. I've you, tried. You can't. <laughs> you really shouldn't be fingering coma patients yeah. anyway. Why would the judge court wear a robe if they didn't want to be fingered? Yeah. <laughs> the study came out less than a year ago that they found out that if you put some of these patients in an fMRI machine, functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, you can actually tell them something, which is imagine playing tennis, and in their brain their brains start looking like somebody's brain who's playing tennis. Very, very interesting. It means that they're hearing people even though they're in a vegetative state. It means that their brain is processing even though they're in a vegetative state, and they're able to do complex actions and imagine complex actions even in a vegetative state. These could be entire human beings trapped inside their body like you would be trapped inside of a prison cell. Finding Forced this- to watch tennis, no less. Yeah. <laughs> Just like Inception. <laughs> finding this out. Now, this story rocked the the scientific community, everybody started paying attention to this stuff now. The one problem is that these fMRI machines are not everywhere. They're yeah. harder to use. It takes a specialist to see them. You, you have to bring a patient expensive in there. As hell. They're expensive. There's not a lot of time on them. These are big issues. What this new study shows that was just released is that you can use an EEG machine, which is much easier. You can use it at a patient's bedside. They're very cheap. They're available at almost any modern-day mm-hmm. first-world hospital. And you can get a similar indication. Now, it's not as strong, not as powerful, doesn't work if the person has some significant brain trauma. But it can show you some of these actions before you have to load them into an fMRI. This could help diagnose people who have been sitting around in comas for 10 years and find out that they've been trapped like fucking animals in cages inside of their own body. Yeah, and the EEG is really nice. It's just sort of a simple needle apparatus, and it'll just spell out Federer, you know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I can hear Mac and Rose yelling. <laughs> the research was published in Plus One Computational Biology. Is that, isn't that a parenting magazine? Pl- plus right. One. Or a dating magazine? Right. <laughs> the researchers showed that the rich and diversely connected networks that support awareness in the healthy brain are typically but not always impaired in patients with the vegetative state. And if they can find some of these well-preserved brain networks that look similar to those in healthy adults – those patients are actually processing basically a similar experience that you would have just if you had your eyes closed and were sitting in a room. Very, very interesting. So this is going to change the old expression, if I could be a fly on the wall, too, if I could be the guy who everyone thinks is in a coma in that room. Yeah. This is going to revolutionize the amount of torture you can give nemesis who are in a coma. Just every day you can just walk in and say, you're being raped by a horse. (laughs) And just walk away. (laughs) Yeah, You could say that now. Okay, question number one. (laughs) 
they have this so-called tennis test, imagining somebody playing tennis within an fMRI machine. But I was thinking, is this tennis test biased towards those who have played tennis? I mean, I feel like if I was in a vegetative state, they might as well ask me to imagine flying through space at light speed because I've done that approximately the same amount of times as I played tennis. You've at least watched more Star Trek. So I would say that you at least have a better visualization of one. What would be a more universal activity to imagine? Masturbating. Yeah, right? Yeah. You think it would look different for guys and girls, though. That You'd have to have a benchmark for both males and females. Yeah, but at least it's something more people can relate to over tennis. Like for a fe- Very few people masturbate at tennis matches. I think the it's EEG wave for female masturbating just looks like a, like a lit candle and the soundtrack to Dawson's Creek. I love Dawson's Creek. <laughs> I know. I, f- I found the DVD. I don't want to the- wait for the reunion of Dawson's <laughs> Creek. <laughs> Fader Beek's career just has to get a little bit more, and then we can do it. Joshua Jackson's pulling his weight. I, I found the, Fair enough. I found the DVD next to the KY in the bathroom. Damien, what about you? Well, I'm glad you gave that answer. It's kind of similar to mine, which mm. is not cry during the notebook. <laughs> that would be the activity we would have people imagine. Then It's universal. Try it. Yeah. No, really? like, that's the test. Like, you make them watch it. Well, a everybody, single everybody can remember I not feel- crying at the notebook or trying not to cry at the end of the I, notebook. I feel like... Damien's trying to institute a bias in which we do not attend to females in comas that are that are conscious. He wants to eliminate you guys, Jackie. You guys, That's weird. Who are you fingering in you this scenario guys... earlier? Rachel McAdams. Oh, right. But what does guys... it matter? I'm thinking of Ryan Gosling the whole time. Wait, when she's old in the movie or as Rachel McAdams young? You know what? Listen, whether okay. I go see Journey in their prime or with the new singer now, I went and saw Journey. I don't care. I'll take Rachel <laughs> McAdams. She, she's married to a time traveler, so it's all relative. Oh, yeah, that's true. Question number two, the original discovery and this additional work may help us reach numerous minds that are trapped in unconscious bodies. If we recently discovered that a man has been in a coma since the mid-90s and he actually has consciousness locked deep inside that body and can hear you, what would you explain to him first about the year 2014? Last thing this guy remembers from pop culture is Bill Clinton, Saved by the Bell, Fucking the bills were awesome. Like, all of that stuff. All of a sudden now, what do you tell him in 2014? The good news is Will Smith is still pretty famous. Yeah. He's actually better looking, too. Yeah. He is better looking but in 2014 than he was in 95. Fresh prince. The new kids in the block? Uh-huh. Turns out they're just a flash in the pan. They're, they're, don't, they're not the next Beatles. Uh, don't that's hold what you on. Think. New Kids on the Block toured last year with the Backstreet Boys. Yeah. So if this guy's a boy band fan, also, he is in the right age. Let's not forget about Wahlburgers. I mean, <laughs> come on. You, there's a step to get on a pedestal, you know? Right. And, and New Kids on the Block was a step to get on that pedestal. That's right. Marky Mark will one day fight Transformers. I mean, I think that's all he needs to know. Question number three. If we found an entire group of people who are conscious and cognizant but trapped in their own brain, what would we offer them to pass the time? In my opinion, it would all of a sudden be very ethically immoral to suddenly let them sit and rot away in a medical room all day. You need to give them something to entertain themselves. Radio shows, books on tape, science comedy podcasts. Hey, there's an idea. How should we alter our treatment towards coma patients we know are aware of their surroundings? But, like, are we to assume that these patients have basically been in solitary confinement? No, I think they stay in a ward where they basically are just in a bed, you know, with a line of ten other people. I mean, they have interaction, I guess, watching people go through. I've watched a documentary about this called Kill Bill, where they talk about (laughs) people in comas, and that's Mm. the equivalent, that's what I get. Volume one or two of that documentary? (laughs) (laughs) Both. They were great. I learned most of what I know about caretaking. From that movie. There's a guy, it's, his name's Buck. He has hobbies. Mm, okay. It would explain the <laughs> ostentatious painting on the back of your car. I like to let the whole world know what I'm about. <laughs> I have hobbies, and I don't want anybody to be confused about what they are. <laughs> what should we do to them? I mean, we got to think of something, I mean, right? Ha- it definitely has to be some form of entertainment, like you're saying. Yeah, and it would have to be audio, because they can't open their audio. eyes. Yeah. What about, like, a phone sex operation? Ooh, that'd be good. So I wonder... Jog their memory? Now, here's the thing. Obviously, they can hear. They get some kind of sensation. I wonder if they can feel. I wonder if they can feel their body. And if so, how the horrible would that be? See if they cry. <laughs> that's a good way to know if they feel. How horrible Damon, would it be to just, have, to just have bed sores and just you can't yeah. move? Oh, God, that'd be excruciating. Not, and you can't kill no. yourself either. You can't, you're just sitting there in yeah. excruciating pain Begging and mind-numbing boredom. The Larry the Cable Guy comedy CD on repeat. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Are we torturing these people even more? <laughs> Article number three, polyamorous Polynesians. Sluts. Well, this is another kind of update to a story. We talked about a story a few months back about a team of geneticists finding Polynesian genetic markers in the bones of native South Americans from the 1800s. Geneticist is, of course, the study of people named Jeanette. 
Yes. <laughs> Thankfully, Nailed all of it. these people were. Nailed it. This was super exciting because it indicates that Polynesians made contact and some cultural exchange with the New World hundreds of years before Columbus. That's fucking amazing, first of all. The yeah, Poly- I thought he discovered the world. Yeah, there was no one here before that. The Polynesians, whose culture originated in Southeast Asia, conquered the Pacific basically in the last 2,000 years, making it at least as far as Easter Island, which is about the closest we know they made it to South America. It's still 3,500 kilometers away, but it's also a tiny little speck in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. And I feel like if they could find that speck, it's not too weird to think that they could find a giant continent on the other side. But necessarily, we didn't have evidence of it. We had some ideas. For instance, the chicken seemed to make it to the Americas before colonists did. And the chicken comes from Southeast Asia. Why did the chicken cross the ocean? Ocean, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. We talked about some stuff with the Andean sweet potato, which we then found on different Polynesian islands that seemed to have predated European colonization, too. So maybe they came, grabbed the sweet potato, took it out. We talked about a story a couple months ago about some geneticists who found what appeared to be Polynesian DNA in a couple of samples. But there was a problem. Because there was a chance it got corrupted from some slaves some dudes brought in the 1800s. We're going to get to that because that's a really interesting part of the story. But first I want to talk about this new work that was done. The new study was done on natives of Easter Island whose DNA shows a European infusion around the 19th century, which is what we would expect, and a much older infusion of DNA from 1300 to 1500 AD that's from the mainland. So it looks like we have evidence of native South American genetics within this population that came into and bred with the Polynesians between 1300 and 1500 AD. Very, very neat stuff. One of the ways they can tell how old it is is the snippets of those DNA like we were talking about. The more times it reproduces, the shorter those little snippets of introduced DNA get. So the longer strain you have, basically the closer you are to the point in which you bred. You can also tell because like one in every 3,500 children born in the Andean Mountains will show evidence of this, of their Easter Island heritage by being born with a huge stone head. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's debilitating, but yeah. what a culture, you know? Yeah. I mean, they tend to tumble down the mountain pretty quick. They're very top heavy. <laughs> so very, very cool. But let's get back to why the previous study didn't work. Because if you didn't hear the previous story a couple months ago, this is also a really interesting thing. About the kids with the big heads? I heard it. So... <laughs> That would fucking revolutionize science. (laughs) One of the reasons that Polynesian DNA within Native South Americans did not necessarily mean that it came from Polynesians that sailed across the ocean, it could have come from slaves, is that Europeans brought slaves over to Brazil way back in the 1800s. I know, it's like bringing sand to the beach, but they want I don't know why. Maybe they like a slave with more bush. Yeah. I mean, who knows? You might think they they want their slaves to be trained in (laughs) jujitsu. You might think. Okay, so they brought Polynesian slaves, which they did. They brought people that could have uh, then migrated over the Andes, bred with these people, still within a timeline to get Polynesian DNA and not have it come across the Pacific Ocean on its own. But what's really interesting is where they got these Polynesian slaves from, which is the island of Madagascar. Now, if you think about it, think in your in your mind a map of Africa. Madagascar is off southern east coast. Is that the theme of park Africa. for the movie? Yes. Yeah. It's one of the largest <laughs> islands in the world. It's also one of the last land masses to get settled. It didn't get settled till 250 AD by human beings, which is a long time away, especially from a place you can basically see from the east coast of Africa. But what's super interesting is the people who settled it weren't Africans, which is why this becomes an issue. Yeah, they were lemurs, we know. <laughs> they were Polynesians from southern Borneo. They went across southern Borneo. So if you guys aren't familiar with Borneo, it's over by Indonesia. Do you think the they- people who settled Madagascar came from Indonesia area across the entire Indian Ocean and settled a parcel of land that was completely unoccupied, even though there was a continent full of people within eyesight. Do you think the Africans, you know, once the Polynesians had settled Madagascar, were like, there goes the neighborhood. Like, I don't even, our property value just went down. Apparently they didn't know because they never went over there. I feel like it had to be like a serendipitous accident. I don't think they set out and were like, we're going to find this Well, I don't know, man. That's what they do. The Africans have been beating us in every single World Series of domination. (laughs) This is our year. I feel like between zero and and like 1500 AD, the Polynesians just pointed their boat in every direction of the map and just went out and colonized the fuck out of the place. Because that's the only thing that explains how they were able to get Hawaii, Easter Island, New Zealand, all of those places. They were just a dominating colonial force, basically. 
So when they, they just want to get away from each other so much, they raise the giant coconut flag. That's how you know they're friendly. And yeah. so that interesting historical hiccup in the population of the world happened to also lead to a hiccup later on when they were testing this, finding the Polynesian DNA and saying, oh, wait, it actually could have come from these Madagascar slaves we brought. Now the evidence seems to indicate that it wasn't from them. In fact, this was from a Polynesian group that landed in South America, 1300, 1500 AD, probably gave them the chicken, got some sweet potatoes back took some brides and took off back to Easter Island where they then set up their population. Fucking amazing story of human history that's told to us in retrospect because of modern science achievements. I cannot believe that as a proud black man, you think of slavery as just a hiccup in human history. Well, I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> oh, it's the same you're reason. Black. Yeah, Got it. the same reason I'm allowed to do that Chris Rock bit. <laughs> Listen, there are black people and then there are Polynesians. <laughs> Polynesians got to go. So I love these stories where we find out some amazing chapter of human history that has otherwise been lost to us for thousands of years. A couple of questions. Number one, scientists believe, based on genetic and archaeological evidence that Polynesians traded, possibly introducing the chicken to Americas and adopting the Andean sweet potato that they then took around Polynesia. And in exchange, they took South American brides back with them to Easter Island. In a sense, chickens in the New World are like a historic dowry from the Polynesians. How many chickens would Jackie be worth? Yeah, let's hear it, guys. Don't don't be chicken with well, your answers. I'm asking you. I'm I'm the asker. I mean, I don't think you can have you ever put read, a price on me. In... Have you ever read that story that's saying if I had a pound of iron, you know, if I turn it into paper clips, it's worth three dollars. If I turn it into nails, it's worth this much. And if I turn it into whatever, it's worth the most. Mm-hmm. Well, what am I doing with these chickens? Like right now, I don't think there's any number of chickens I would trade. Uh, I have no... Oh, you keep me? That's sweet. But if we're talking like fried chicken strips, a couple costco size bags. First of all, Jackie, let's back your ego the fuck out of this real quick and look at it logically, okay? <laughs> there is some amount of chickens that you're clearly worth. For instance, chicken. if Foster Farms tells me we'll pay you a buck a chicken body and I can get a billion chickens, yes, I will gladly murder you for that billion dollars wait murder me i thought we were just i thought i was just getting hitched oh it doesn't matter to me once i get the once i get the chicken money whatever happens to you is irrelevant i call foul play jackie here's the real question how many chickens do you think you're worth maybe like thousands Mm. and the correct answer baker's dozen all right on to question number two (laughs) how crazy is it that seafaring settlers from the other side of an ocean occupied both madagascar and south america what made these polynesians such great and curious explorers all those big heads, you know, there's a lot of room for imagination in there. That's true. So they could think big, you know. Big block heads. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think they were great sailors, but truth be told, they kept trying to sail in a straight line. But because they're Asian, it just... Yeah. Well, oh, it was, gotcha. It was like a Mr. Magoo's wacky adventure around the ocean. So we think of them as great explorers. In fact, they were just trying to get like from Borneo to Indonesia and yeah. ended up in Hawaii. You know, in like a comedy of errors. <laughs> <laughs> Benny Hill theme song playing in the entire in the background the entire way. <laughs> Love that answer. Let's move right on to the lightning round. <laughs> lightning round in which I give my hosts three questions that are all one sentence or less, and my hosts try and answer with one sentence or less answers. Let's get started. Starting with question number one, a new statistical analysis suggests what almost certainly went extinct two and a half million years ago? Damien's sex life. Oh, before you were even born. (laughs) Prior to the history of humanity. In your face. I am sure that whatever common ancestor I was at 2.5 million years ago, he was cleaning up whatever tail his species was supposed to be cleaning up tail with. They didn't have tails at that time, though. (laughs) We're really in the homo habilis earlier gaster period at that point in human history. Oh, oh, I bet he's homoing the habilis out of every chick around. (laughs) Possibly do. Let's just do the rest of the podcast in his voice, sir. (laughs) Uh, Damien, what do you think almost certainly went extinct two and a half million years ago? The Garden of Eden. Without man in there, there was no reason to keep this thing going. Wow, so humans no. came from the Garden of Eden two and a half million years ago. You're thinking the Garden of Eden is back in, in Homo habilis times. Yeah. Wow. Did not ever think that biblical stories could stretch back that far. Okay. That, well, that's why we evolved to our new surrounding. Homo habilis was the perfect species for Eden. Oh, on, on he lived Earth. there very happily. We fucked right. up. Yeah. And, and then we adapted to our new surroundings and mm-hmm. learned war. 
and other things that never existed in life. Uh, you guys heard Damien. Creationism is true. The actual <laughs> answer, Megalodon. So if you guys don't yes, know about... Yes, really? Yeah. Oh, man, I fucking love Megalodon. <laughs> Jackie, would you like to tell the listeners about Megalodon if they haven't Megalodon heard about Megalodon is a giant prehistoric shark, basically. It looks like a big great white. Essentially yeah, looks like somebody gave a great white Japanese radiation. Yeah, and it's it's enormous. And my favorite is when they make the little drawing of, of the great white shark next to Megalodon, which yeah. like it's barely the size of its mouth. Yeah. Ugh. I've always wanted Megalodon to be true. A giant great white shark is maybe like 18 feet. That's a yeah. giant great white shark. Giant male. Uh, Megalodons were about 50 feet long. Yeah. So these are gigantic predators, but a lot of people, especially because of Discovery Channel's horrible journalistic ethics, oh, it was think so fun, though. they think that it's still alive because they like to put out fake documentaries about it. It's they entertaining. Did, they did a statistical analysis of all the fossils found uh, from Megalodon around the world and did a technique called optimal linear estimation to infer when it actually became extinct by examining the distribution of gaps between fossil dates throughout time and that kind of gives you a an idea of when that animal tapered out and then finally went extinct and they say it's very unlikely that it made it past two and a half million years ago very interesting though because that is really geologically speaking not that long ago yeah there were members like we talked about of our ancestral species that weren't that far away from us walking around two and a half million years ago thankfully they weren't swimming through the oceans with this giant beast running around but that just proves to me similar to how creationism is true as damien pointed out Uh that megalodon is still around yeah we will find him and i will see it on shark week and i will rejoice and a lot of people say oh if you lived in the deep ocean we wouldn't find him and stuff the fact is we would it's just such a large creature it's hard to have that amount of body mass when you die you'll come to the surface we'll find you uh, also you would have huge marks on other animals that we would be able to distinguish we would uh, still be other animals he went super deep with yeah. gotcha <laughs> and I mean it's not like a coincidence are we not doing the voice anymore <laughs> it's not like when we find megalodon fossils that's some kind of coincidence and all of a sudden all the modern teeth and stuff would go away we would still be finding megalodon teeth if megalodon was still around in the same way that we find their fossil teeth We'd also have a lot of evidence from underwater cameras, deep sea ocean work, all that kind of stuff. Sorry, guys, Megalodon is gone, but two and a half million years might be within the range of opportunity to salvage DNA, especially on well-preserved stuff. So if there is something deep inside one of those teeth, maybe Jurassic Park Ocean? I'm changing careers right now. Bye, my Sharknado 3. Question number two. What promise has science finally delivered on? Megalodon. Which I'm fucking psyched well, about. Sci- Wait, it just told us he was definitely dead for two and a half million <laughs> years. he was real. Yeah, we always knew he was real. We found the fossils. It's like a real, like a dinosaur. Unicorns. We already knew. Yeah. But now we know when. And then it's probably now. <laughs> That's what you said, right, Bobby? That's Damien, what, what promise said? has science finally delivered on? Uh, if science finally decided to pay me back, as it promised once it made it big. Science oh, so science. Shit. You lent science some money. I lent science some money in high school. Like, mm-hmm. uh, he needs some money to go to school. You know, I was dealing at the time. I had a little skrill. He said um, he would pay you back. And, and now he just doesn't return your calls. And now, now here he is with his uh-huh. fancy degree yeah. and all these patents. Uh-huh. And he's finally paying me back. Oh, he is paying you back. I thought yeah. you were saying he was. Okay. No, he finally promised. Like, I was, yeah. I was so anti science for the longest time because yeah. I was thinking, this fool owes me money, this nerdy dude. The actual answer. Hoverboards. I'm sure you guys have probably seen this all over the news. The idea is that hoverboards, which in theory are a possible thing, because under Lentz's law, a change in electric current will generate a counterbalancing current in nearby conducting materials, and each will produce a magnetic field that will repel the other. It's hard to make something relying on magnetic fields stable, though, because there's just so many forces involved. There's also a huge disproportionate force between gravity and electromagnetism that makes it difficult. But... It does seem that one company has done a lot to go in one direction. They have a hoverboard that can work on a very specific surface. You have to have this very specific copper surface for it to work on, but it's quite cool. You can go online and check it out. He's doing like some stuff on a half pipe. And for $300 on their Kickstarter, you can get a hovering box. They'll literally send you this kit where you can make your own hovering box to try and make o- your oh, own hover products. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's a it's sex like, swing called the hovering box. So it's, I'm picturing like a paraplegic woman just hovering there waiting for me. You could definitely make a sex toy out of this hover just thing. Friday, you put a fleshlight in the top of this thing and yeah. you go up and down. Yeah. Very interesting. I don't think we're getting Marty McFly quite yet. But hey, you there's could, the Marty McFly reference. Yeah. Because the problem Ask is you show this is never going to work on 
uh, concrete. This is never going to work on asphalt. You're just not going to have the same. You're not going to be able to generate the same magnetic force to repel yourself up. Not enough to to get up. At least not what, with what we currently know. <laughs> That's so what you, they said about megalodon. So you, could be, you could be pulled by a train or something. A no, subway. but you can go to specific areas. Like if they made a skate park out of this material, you could go and have a blast flying around on your sweet hoverboard. So look for stuff like that coming out. It it will be involved in some form of technology soon. The reason this is just coming out now is new batteries are allowing us to provide enough energy to this thing. These type of systems use a substantial amount of energy to have enough magnetic force to push you up. New batteries are allowing us to do that. As batteries get better, we'll see a little bit more of that come through. How, how long is it until the skateboard's looked at as the old-timey bike with the big front wheel? Oh, that's right. <laughs> like Tony Hawk was looked at as an old-timey pussy. <laughs> Question number three. What have scientists done to mice that might significantly impact your own medical future? Put a vagina on the back of every mouse. <laughs> That will significantly impact my future. And social life. Damn it. All right. I've been trying to keep this under wraps yep. pretty much my entire you career. You do do a lot of mouse work. But it's going to come out eventually, and I'd rather be on the, f- the good side of it. Please, mouse vagina. Please, mouse vagina. Please, mouse vagina. Well, it turns out we've been making human penises on mice. This big floppy donged mouse. Yeah, it wasn't my idea. Yeah. Does it just suck the mouse dry of blood whenever it gets an erection? Thankfully, Damien, they're like orcas in that in captivity, it stays floppy the whole time. <laughs> but yes, it would kill them if they ever got an erection. That's why you can never let Dick Mouse free. He's destined to be kept in captivity. It's okay. Oh, here's a movie. Yeah. All right. All of a sudden, it's you're still Dick called Mouse. Free Willy. <laughs> There's Vagina Mouse, but even meeting Vagina Mouse could kill Dick Mouse, just even spotting Vagina Mouse. The truth is, Vagina Mouse was too expensive. We had to go with Dick Mouse. Jackie, you could justify your decision any which way. We knew it was going Dick Mouse. Hey, hey, I'm just a cog, okay? Well, then why is he black? Why is it a black dick? (laughs) You know goddamn well why. The actual answer, they were able to fix hearing loss. A team of audiologists have successfully restored hearing and noise deafened mice by increasing the production of a certain protein within the inner ear. So when sound waves enter our inner ear, they bend over specified hair cells called stereocilia, and the bent hairs use ribbon synapses to communicate with nerve cells, sending the signal to the brain where it's interpreted as sound. After a while, the pathway can be damaged through normal aging, overexposure to loud noises, that kind of stuff. Uh, So what they did is they were able to promote a protein that is essential for formation of maintenance and ribbon synapses, and by improving those ribbon synapses, they were able to reverse damage due to basically loud noises and aging. We all know about LASIK surgery for your eyes. This might be the version of LASIK surgery for your ears in the future. The only other way to reverse the damage before was to have Superman fly around the Earth in a reverse pattern enough yes. times. But, it, I mean, it's every time somebody wants to turn back time, Superman has to do that. It's, yeah, it's unrealistic. It's exhausting. Yeah, especially because he's got a lot more drag now with that dong on his back. <laughs> oh, what a great lightning round. Let's move right on to finish my story. Finish my story, where one of us has to complete the other's balls. I still am laughing about Free Willy. <laughs> pretty proud of it <laughs> it's still called free will you should be I mean, well, that's also, the joke of the day right there it's also the visual of a dick just flaccidly slumped sideways like an orca <laughs> dorsal fit that's what really I like Sorry. for those of you who haven't heard before this is finished my story in which our research scientist Jackie starts us with the beginning of a modern scientific story and myself and Damien compete to try and finish that story Damien you ready yeah I'm ready to give one answer let's do it let's kill this motherfucker go for it Jackie <laughs> alright gentlemen would you consider yourselves cool in high school? I think that I wasn't the coolest guy made me the coolest guy. Uh, okay. I, uh, so what I would say is I taught others how to be cool. Like you were cooler? Yeah. Like you're so cool that you taught cool? Like, I was, like a cool factory. Yeah. You're okay. like, you're like, a, like a mass- I was more like a cool sensei. Okay. Well, I went to high school with both of you, and you weren't cool. I just want to know what you'd say to that. But, but, <laughs> but the idea of being cool, you know, obviously popularity is really important to kids nowadays. Or not even nowadays, but always, you know. Mm-hmm. Think back to yeah. Rebel being, Without a Cause images, you know, being cool in high school well, I was comes too cool with a lot of school. benefits. I didn't have to go once I was too cool oh, for school. Oh, you were school. too cool for school, so that's why you didn't go. Yeah. It wasn't because you were fucking lazy. Yeah, like Bobby – was too cool for school, but it was even cooler that he went. Yeah, that's how. That's why people like knew. You're so cool. You, yeah. Okay. You went They're like, to you're too cool for school, and yet you're here. Holy fuck, how could you try less? This is amazing. <laughs> okay. Healthy egos. Yeah. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really proud of you guys. You're talking to cool dudes here. 
So it's sounding like cool is, is a positive thing. Yeah. I'm just wondering. We're pretty familiar with it. How do you guys think being cool in high school influences your adult life? Well, it certainly gives you a better base of STDs to start out with. I mean, no, you got to sure. collect those early, get yeah. your immunity up, then you can bang away later in yeah. life and be much better off. The learning of advanced social skills in high school through being popular will yeah. have a negative effect on your life. Okay. Like if you're an artist, you will never experience the sadness of not being accepted by a group or not being able to get laid or not being able to – so like it, it will cripple you as an artist. Okay. But in every other way, you'll be a happy, wonderful person. Just So just for artists? Well, I mean, if you're an artist, the only way it affects you negatively. I mean, like having sex, like you can't write about pain if you've been popular and liked and been in the life of a party everywhere you've been. Okay, so if you're cool, then you have to get any other job except art. Plus, if you play football, you're really made fun of for being an artist. They kind of correct that along the way. Okay, but it does pay off because, like you said, you know how, how is being cool pay off later in life? If you do play football, probably have a Letterman jacket, high resale value later in life. That's like a retirement savings that you've just got stocked away. You know? Well, it depends if you it was a good team. I mean, well, you can. I mean, we all have letterman jackets. Well, Makes you, know, you statistically you... less likely to be a serial killer. You just answered. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. You're also, right. Also, as I'm somebody who was pretty cool in high school personally, I can attest that as didn't I, you just answer that as I get later on in life, I realize that uh, even though I keep getting older, they stay the same age. Uh, mm. I believe. So you're going to yell at him for that second answer? No. No, that was a quote. Um, yeah. That was a quote from a Matthew McConaughey yeah. character. Uh, Damien, I don't know if you knew this, but one answer. of the advantages of being cool in high school is that it allows you to have sex with 17 year olds for at least eight years after you graduate. Yeah. Every fucking week, you two try to. No, just that's one right. answer, one week. Have you one seen week. Days and Confused? Maybe he just hasn't seen it. He just hasn't he seen probably it. Hasn't he probably seen hasn't it. seen okay, it. Okay, just bring on the next answer. Just, just, <laughs> just get to it. There's not another answer. I mean, I might, I might also inform you that being cool in high school also helps you host a science podcast with two of the nerds you knew from high school later on. Oh, wow. Well. I think we're ready to go on to the real answer. Two nerds. Uh-huh. Uh, might be right. replaced. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> well, these are pretty pretty decent answers you guys had. I, as the nerd, Bobby Sagan, I'm not going to pretend I was cool in high school. Mm-hmm. I was definitely a nerd. That's why I have such amazing friends now. That's mm-hmm. why we don't know you, didn't know you, and pretended not to know you. It turns out that students who tried to act cool in early, early adolescence were more likely than their peers who didn't act cool to experience a range of problems in early adulthood. So this is a study done by the University of Virginia Mm -hmm. and came out in the Society for Research and Child Development. Well, they chose a real cool state to do this in. (laughs) In Virginia, yeah. So the researchers followed 184 teens from age 13 when they were in 7th and 8th grades to age 23. And they collected information from the teens about themselves as well as from their peers and parents. So Mm -hmm. self-evaluation as well as like, okay, seriously, is this guy cool? The teens attended public school in suburban and urban areas in the southeastern United States and were from racially and ethnically diverse backgrounds. So they they have a very wide population. So teens who were romantically involved at an early age engaged in delinquent activity and placed a premium on hanging out with other physically attractive peers that were thought to be popular by other kids at age 13. But over time, the sentiment faded. By 22, those used-to-be-cool teens were rated by their peers as being less competent in managing social relationships, and they were more likely to have significant problems with alcohol and drugs and to have engaged in criminal activities. So by the time you're 22, being cool in high school is now no longer cool as an adult. I wonder how much is causation correlation, though, because if you think about it, the type of person who would have access to like a more free lifestyle, substances, and you know maybe a, a cool house to go hang out at when you're 13 and you can drink beer and that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. you would be cooler, but also you'd be much less likely to be set up for success later in life. And so I wonder if some of that is more of the correlation, not that they were cool that this happened, but the type of kid that has the type of freedom to allow this to happen and be cool is also the type of kid that doesn't do well later on. Like, are you cool naturally or are you cool because you have shitty parents? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, well, that's actually what they go on to talk about in the article. They say that when you think about the so-called cool teen behavior mm-hmm. – that's linked to early popularity. Over time, these teens needed more and more extreme behaviors to try and appear cool, yeah. at least to a subset of other teens. So it's like over time, you have to look more extreme, more cool. And yeah. even though the population might get smaller of who thinks you're cool, you still try and do these behaviors to be cool. Like the first, I'm so full of Mountain Dew. I don't know if I can get cooler or more extreme, man. <laughs> I, I just had a 12-pack. No, like you start out as a guy. You know, you get a leather jacket, and then you get the hair done up, and then maybe you get the cool car. And finally, by the end, you, finally you jump the shark. <laughs> <laughs> the you're, megalodon. 
By the end, you're just attaching dicks to your back and hoping everything works out for you. <laughs> well, it was just nice for me because I know other fellow nerds have enjoyed watching Facebook trials and tribulations of girls that were popular in high school getting knocked up early and getting really ugly. No. So, you know, just to know that, that that's petty. a phenomenon. Yeah, well. That's right, women. Having so, a baby. So the guys who thought they were really cool in high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? At least we can never get pregnant. And become a mother and then ugly because that's what happened. What you just said is all pregnant women get ugly. No, that's not what I said. I said all the mothers get ugly. Girls got ugly. Jackie, which one of us do you think won? I think Damien won. Damien taking my lead down to only two points. Good yeah, job. I think Damien won. I'm going to pretend that there was not an ounce of charity in that mm-hmm. and that you're not well, just I saying that so you can you let both. him have 12 answers next time. I did insult you both at the end, so that was kind of me shooting yeah, myself I'm, in the I'm foot. A little, I'm a little upset, Bobby. Yeah. I feel like uh, when you said that I was priceless in terms of chickens yeah. that we really made sort of a connection. oh if you took any positive thing positive out of that then okay, well i gave I was... you the point and i think maybe we should just focus on that and by the way i'd just like to distance myself a little bit from some misogynist statements that were made earlier i don't think all pregnant women become ugly that's a horrible thing for jackie to have said I did, as a I supporter of that. women in feminism i am somewhat offended and i think damien is as well i didn't yeah. say that and yeah, you're also the blackest man in the room too you're yeah. actually you're actually a black guy yeah so if you disagree with them that's racist mm-hmm. so if you want to Come back and join Black Bobby, Misogynist Jackie, and Tiny Dick Damien. Come on back for Science (laughs) Faction episode 43 next week. The B team. And for the record, I got a dick on my own back. I mean, it's my dick and I taped it there, but, you know, who wants a ride? You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. 